Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from Velocity 2018 in San Jose. I'm here with Denali from Box. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Good. So what do you do at Box? So I'm Director of Engineering for the Enterprise Group. Um, at Box, we have four different orgs within engineering. Um, focused on different users. Uh, we have one group that is focused on developer API, um, basically all of the features and software needed for people who want to build software on top of Box. Um, we have another group focused on the actual end user, people who are um, you know, using, uploading files, using the website, mobile, etc. Um, we have another group focused just on generic platform services that are needed for any software system. Uh, storage, messaging, networking, etc. Um, and then we have the enterprise group, and uh, we are focused on features and products for the IT admin and the chief information security officer. So people who are concerned about compliance, security, cost management, and, and basically deploying box for their company. So people like the people who are here at this Velocity event. That's right, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. So are you meeting good people here? Is this like the tribe that would be a box enterprise customer? It does, it does feel that way, and actually in the recruiting booth, talking with people, we need to be careful because we have a lot of customers, but we also see a lot of people we'd like to hire, so. <laughs> That's good, probably, right? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So what does your day-to-day -day look like at Box if you're the director of engineering? I mean, what, what hits your plate? Um, so right now, I think the big focus for me, I've actually just joined in the past three months, um, so I'm still relatively new at Box, but the big focus for me has been on really building a strong staff so that we can uh, perform and then really um, kind of move the needle and, and really succeed with our product. Um, but in order to do that, we need to have a healthy staff. So um, it's been a lot of work around um, recruiting and how to make that more efficient and more optimized and how to innovate there. We've uh, introduced some new programs and some new approaches that I'm super excited about that I think will help us find uh, talented people outside of sort of the, you know, the standard pools that t traditionally people look at. Um, and then beyond that, we'll move into, we've already started moving into also focusing on retention. So, you know, staff is, is just like any other business problem. Um, you know, getting a strong pipeline of uh, sales incoming doesn't really mean anything if there's a certain percentage of churn. Right. 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 And in fact, existing employees are, you know, just like existing customers, um, are more valuable over time. Uh, so retention uh, programs around essentially training the management team in terms of how to be excellent managers in a more formal way. Um, I think management is one of those interesting fields where um, it's very unique. There's, there's just not a lot of formal training that's really given um, and sort of uh, you know, clear tools, what makes a good manager, what makes a bad manager. Most people can't even really answer that question. They don't know. Um, and I, I'd say that a good manager is someone who can hire and retain staff and meet the business goals. So let me ask you about good and bad. What's a good candidate? When you, when you see, because you sit down with That's candidates, a great question. engineering, what's a good candidate like? That's a great question. So I, my whole perspective on the recruiting industry is that it's ripe for disruption and there's uh, you know, tons of inefficiency and waste and in terms of both time and money. Um, and the way that we're approaching hiring is, um, is definitely non-optimal. Uh, and I have lots of thoughts in terms of where to improve and how to, how to do that. But for me, when I look at candidates, what I'm actually mostly interested in is um, the ability to learn and to grow and to improve. Um, there's this fascinating research that's been done at Stanford about the growth mindset, um, which is something that we've, you know, we're learning more about with children in different, uh, in different uh, communities and groups across the country, high school students, but I think the same thing can apply for professional workers and adults as well, which is um, not just for the individual, but also for the company and the organization, which is how do you approach failure? And you can actually understand a lot about the real values and ethics of a company um, immediately after there's been a very large failure. What happens in that moment? Um, and so, you know, trying to find people who are comfortable with failure, who can learn and improve. Those are the people you want to hire. And so do you elicit failure out of them, like uh, in your interview questions? Uh, ask them, what, it, what is your big, biggest epiphany when you failed? 
you know, I try to I try to talk through um, you know past experiences that people have had that are both good and bad and get a sense of what was the kind of flexibility and what was the dynamic in terms of after this failure um, how did they improve or or move forward yeah for Excellent. sure so how how important are technical chops as well I mean do you want someone with a really solid technical pedigree so uh, technical skill is important. Um, it's also sort of dependent on the team. So you want you know, a healthy team dynamic, and that can be supported by having a variety of different levels and skills. And so typically, you know, one, one common failure pattern that we see in industry is, um, especially for startups, is you know, it's much easier to hire more junior folks than it is to hire more senior folks, typically. And you can overhire, and you can have these you know, teams and groups of really amazing junior developers um, but none of them have really kind of gone through the experience of scaling a system or understand the importance of architecture. you know architecture, uh, test automation, CI, CD, the investments that we make now and how they sort of impact the future. So you definitely uh, find these companies um, that have succeeded as startups and moved into more kind of mid-sized companies that now have these just tremendous problems around technical debt and architecture. Uh, lack of architecture that then need to be addressed, and they're much more costly. Um, so I think the the key to um, technical skill is really to think holistically about the team and what the team needs, and make sure that you have a, an even distribution, uh, junior, mid, and senior level experience. And your teams get to learn and use all sorts of different technologies because you're interfacing with a lot of enterprises that have a lot of different technologies in play that you're interacting with. Is that true? Or? Um, so I think actually, to be honest, uh, we have a, sort of a legacy monolith system written in PHP. Um, we have a little bit of uh, software written in Scala from about 10 years ago when that was hip. Okay. Don't blame yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but most of the stuff we're doing now is actually either in Java or JavaScript with Node um, as we're moving into a services architecture with uh, Java or JavaScript being sort of the primary supported languages. And I actually think that's the right approach. Um, I've worked at companies where it's like, you know, choose any language, choose any framework that suits you, you know, go have fun. And I think um, it's actually much more efficient to standardize on the languages that make sense for the problems that you're dealing with, because it kind of allows you to then standardize on the development environment and the IDE and the um, release process and sort of the tools that can then be built in to support the developers around linting, testing, error, you know, throttling, um, uh, failover, logging, all these things um, that need to be done well, um, and, but that aren't really part of sort of the core application business logic. So I think standardizing on languages and technologies um, allows the business to provide those templates and that support um, so that the developers can move faster and just focus on the actual business problem. And do you guys have R&D going on at Box as well? Like, do you have an R&D group? I think we would say that we have a build organization, which is composed of engineers and product managers, and um, this would be considered the R&D group. Okay, Yeah. excellent. So if you look forward at, at, at Box in the next, like, let's say six months, what do you want to see change for your enterprise engineering team. What would you like to see change in the next six months? So in the next six months, what I'm hoping to do is help the team to really become outstanding, both with, with hiring and with training, and how we interact with each other, giving immediate feedback, both positive and negative. This is a simple thing that we should do that most, most companies still don't do. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we, we had a whole training in radical candor. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So helping people be comfortable with that, because it's very hard, right? Um, have especially negative feedback can be extremely scary. Um, but that helping would be honest feedback, <laughs> not negative, but just <laughs> right. honest. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so getting the team in a really solid place and then helping us move forward such that we're putting equal emphasis on enterprise grade software development and value to the customer and doing that every sprint, every two weeks. So basically making sure that we're shipping sort of a balance of um, doing things with excellence, um, again, with in terms of sec you know security, quality, reliability, all of these things, but also making sure that we're delivering value to the customer quickly. Um, I'm really excited about Box because I'm very bullish on Box. Um, maybe not for some of the reasons that are um, you know being discussed or um, covered recently around AI and skills, 
but more because uh, I've spent about 20 years working in industry in both um, quality and uh, security. And I see a very clear trend coming, which is um, just a, a very you know, clear increase in cyber attacks in both uh, frequency and also depth and effectiveness. Um, and I also see kind of the, the legislature uh, across you know, the world um, coming up with ways to try and mitigate this and ways to, you know, create laws that help us uh, manage, you know, protection of data and protection of people and, you know, protection of software. And so I see this as sort of a growing arms race, actually, that will just continue and intensify and uh, become bigger and bigger. And so the idea that there's this, um, there's a product like Box that companies can leverage and use, especially if they're not, you know, sort of at their core uh, technology companies, that can offer these services that basically say, you know, we've taken care of all of the compliance requirements. If you use Box, um, we make it seamless and easy to, you know, be GDPR, GDPR compliant, right, right. or SOX, or HIPAA, yeah, or right. GXP, or any of the other, like, you know, vertical specific regulations. Yeah. Um, and additionally, we have all of these additional security capabilities that you can turn on easily for a defense in depth strategy where you just have safety nets at every point um, to help protect the business. So to me, that seems like a super high value thing that people will be willing to pay for that will be really helpful as we move forward in this sort of changing landscape of uh, cybersecurity. All that in six months, that's <laughs> quite a quick journey. Well, yeah, yeah. one step at a time, but yeah. 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 Excellent, well we look yeah. forward to that journey with you, thank you. Thanks.